Good morning and evening, everyone. I hope you're all staying safe and healthy. Welcome to the Voices of Sustainability Virtual Farsight chat series. Uh, I'm Marco Duzo. I am a partner uh, at EY, where I lead uh, sustainability uh, in EMEA for strategy and transactions. This is, the Zayed Sustainability Prize was established in 2008 as the United Arab Emirates pioneering global award for recognizing organizations and global high schools for their sustainable, innovative, and humanitarian solutions. Today, the prize counts 15 years of global impact with over 378 million people around the world benefiting from its winners' solutions across the categories of health, food, energy, water, climate action, and global high schools. In today's episode, we will delve into the topic of improving access to water, recognizing both the innovators on the ground and their behind the scenes partners in honor of August World Humanitarian Day. Now I'll introduce our guest speakers. Stefano Racitti is the Chief Operating Officer of Mubadala Energy, a Beyond 2020 partner. Alexandra Anjouer is the Executive Director of Electricien Saint Frontier, a 2020 Zayed Sustainability Prize winner in the energy category. And Caroline uh, Flory is the Senior Director of Technology for Development at Mercy Corps and based in the Philippines. Uh, we've also been joined by, um, by Monique Tungia, who is the Founder and Executive Director of Green Girls Organization. So welcome to our guest speakers. Our conversation today will focus on the pivotal, pivotal role that partners play in relation to organizations like Mercy Corps, EWB, and Green Girls Organization, and why it is crucial for entities like Mubadala Energy to support and empower such organizations to drive and accelerate positive change globally. So to begin, let me quickly introduce Beyond 2020 as an initiative that connects the technology of the Zayed Sustainability Prize winners and finalists with last mile communities, allowing them to further scale existing sustainable solutions to shape a better future for all. So with this, I think we can start and uh, uh, maybe Stefano, let me, let me start from you. Uh, to begin, let's explore the convergence of uh, technical proficiency and humanitarian initiatives. How does Mubadala Energy leverage its technical capabilities by identifying and evaluating uh, technology providers to support sustainability initiatives such as Beyond 2020? Thank you, Marco, and uh, good afternoon, everyone uh, from uh, Abu Dhabi. So first of all, as I mentioned, uh, Mubadala Energy is an international uh, uh, energy uh, uh, company headquartered in Abu Dhabi. And uh, like most of uh, uh, energy companies, we have a strong culture of uh, uh, problem solving and uh, risk management. Any energy business is made up of a variety of uh, different people with different uh, uh, skill set, experiences, and, uh, and approaches. But at the end, at our core, what uh, unifies all of us is that we are all problem solvers. Um, the engineering, the process, the safety, the geological uh, challenges of our uh, uh, projects, of our developments, of our investments, uh, we, we, which we deliver through strong uh, collaboration, uh, lateral thinking, and uh, uh, positivity uh, amongst the, the teams. Today, uh, we, we make use uh, of these uh, 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 capabilities uh, and qualities, and uh, combined with uh, digital technologies, such as uh, uh, big data, uh, artificial intelligence, predictive maintenance, machine learning, to create value and at the end of the day, solve problems. We, uh, we have joined the uh, Zayed Sustainability Prize and the 20 by 20 uh, initiative uh, because it is very much aligned to our uh, culture and our uh, approach to community investment, which is uh, consists of a number of uh, elements. Uh, 
for example, uh, we, we, we partner with the local communities where we operate. We spend a lot of uh, time, effort, and financial commitment to ensure we create a bond and support the, 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 the local communities in many different ways, whether it is uh, education, is uh, healthcare, is um, environmental. We always uh, engage with the community to see how we can make a positive impact uh, and ensure we have their uh, understanding and support to, uh, uh, of our uh, presence and uh, our uh, plans and our developments. Uh, deploying, uh, we, we focus on deploying uh, technologies which uh, will uh, solve real world problems. That's why we want to understand what are the issues with the specific communities. Partnership is in our DNA. Uh, it, it, it's one of the pillars of our uh, business. Uh, we deliver our business through partnership. Uh, uh, all our uh, 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 operations around the world are uh, uh, with partners uh, as, as investors and also partnership with our key stakeholders, regulators, and, and so on. Uh, just last, last, last year, um, uh, we reached well over 120,000 people through our uh, uh, community uh, investment initiatives around the areas where we operate. We also uh, want to be, and we are the beacon for Abu Dhabi and the UAE. We see ourselves as the as an ambassador for the uh, for Abu Dhabi as an international energy company, and uh, we want to make sure that uh, uh, this is clear to um, in the eleven countries where we uh, operate. Uh, there is a clear parallel uh, in what we do with the. Uh, 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 Zayed Sustainability uh, Prize and the 20 by 20, uh, in addition to the alignment with some of the key uh, markets um, uh, where we operate. For example, the 20 by 20 has delivered project in uh, Egypt, where we are present, uh, similar in, in Indonesia and in, uh, in Malaysia. We spend time in identifying the right technology uh, for the right project. Uh, it's never uh, uh, one size uh, fits all approach when it comes to technology. Uh, there are many uh, uh, options, there are many uh, providers uh, to the market, and therefore we need to assess them and make sure that uh, they are uh, uh, um, suited, for, suited for, the, for the applications and they can scale up uh, quickly. Our approach has been uh, uh, platform agnostic. We need the best solution to challenge uh, the, the, the problem uh, face. This is the same, uh, I think this is the same with the 2020 and beyond 2020. Uh, the 20 by 20 and beyond 2020. It's not about technology leading, but instead is the nature of the challenge that leads to the right uh, solution. Finally, we take uh, an engineering or a scientific approach to the challenge, but also we recognize that it's very important to humanize the, the, the solution. And uh, more and more, we talked about humanizing the technology, but also humanizing the way we deliver energy around the, 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 the countries, the place we work in. For, for example, we are deploying new uh, artificial intelligence and predictive HSSC tools, but ultimately the success of this uh, technology comes down how, we, uh, how they interact with the uh, human, uh, and I will explain later uh, for, and give some example. And we believe this is uh, also same for the 20 by 20 and beyond 2020 projects, where uh, it's, uh, it's uh, the, the connection uh, between the, the technology, the solutions, and the humans is uh, crucial for the, the success of the, of the, uh, the initiatives. Many thanks, Stefano. Um... And Alexandre, uh, Stefano talked about partnership. How has your partnership with Beyond 2020 and its partners enabled you to scale up your technical operations in Africa? Okay, thank you, Marco, for this uh, interesting question. Maybe I will say a few words about our NGO, first of all. So Electrician Without Border is a French uh, NGO, uh, which is a uh, which is operating more than 30 years uh, ago. 
Uh, we are working with volunteers. We have 1,200 uh, volunteers uh, located in France, in Germany, in Italy, but also in Africa, especially uh, in Benin, in Togo, in Senegal, in Ivory Coast. And they are working to build our project. Of course, we have employees too, but the, the core of our project, our energy, our strength is made of the volunteers we, who, are, who are working in uh, the solidarity field. So what is our ambition? What is uh, our goal? Uh, it's to fight against uh, the inequalities in access to electricity, to water, because uh, accessing to water is only possible when you have a good electricity connection at the end. So it's totally linked. And our, another ambition we have is to give access to good sanitation. We would love to say a good project is a holistic project is to say you deal with access to electricity, access to water, and access to the good sanitation at the same time. And at the end, it makes something good for local communities and you can find an financial equilibrium coping with these three challenges at the same time. And then we, we, also, we also try to create a good business model, let's say, to, to make some income generating activities to make it uh, sustainable over the, the long uh, over the long run. So we we won the Zayed Prize in 2020. Uh, so what I need to say first, it was a great recognition of, of our work, and especially it was a great recognition of our work for and towards uh, refugee. Uh, it was a project uh, was put in place in uh, in Bangladesh uh, for. Um, for the refugee coming from uh, Myanmar, uh, in the north of Myanmar, you have a lot of, uh, let's say, ethnic conflicts, and you have a lot of refugees uh, who are currently located in Bangladesh, and they are in several camps, and we had to give them uh, access to electricity, especially for women to improve the level of security during the night, because when you get access to electricity to a population, you often give access to security at the same time. So it was a lot of money for, for, for us. It was six six hundred thousand uh, dollars. So it, it make a real change for, for us. And it uh, enables the uh, electrician of the to deploy new projects, not only in Africa, because we also put in place a big project in Lebanon. Just after the explosion in the port uh, of Beirut, we decided to deploy a project uh, um, of, uh, of a, the goal of the project was to install solar panel on the roof of various uh, schools in Beirut because the, the connection to the grid uh, currently in Lebanon is very, very poor. It's, it's approximately two to four hours a day. So we have been able, thanks to this money, to deploy this project. And we also deployed other projects uh, through the African continent, especially in Benin, uh, in Madagascar, uh, also in Togo and also in Burkina Faso, uh, it was uh, it was also a way for us to to test, to try, and to deploy in different uh, field. Uh, it was not only electricity; it was also how to pump water in a very sustainable way. It is said not to pump water thanks to oil or another uh, high carbon intensity energy, but only thanks to solar panel. So we have been able to deploy uh, this type of technology in Burkina Faso, uh, especially to irrigate uh, the, the crops uh, for, for farmer, for small familial uh, farmer. And the last thing I, I want to say, maybe it's, it's winning the Zayed uh, Prize was also an opportunity for us to, to build new partnership with donors, with company, with local association and NGO because Electrician Without Borders is not a very famous uh, NGO around the world. Even in France, we are a small one. So winning such a prize is also an international recognition. And, and international recognition goes with, uh, goes with more partnership. And that's, that's the great opportunity we, we have been able to say. Thank you. Thanks, Alexandre. Very inspiring. And uh, Carla, moving to you. Um, so your work focuses on leveraging uh, data-driven analysis to support poverty eradication. Could you share a specific example of how technology and data have been used 
to address the humanitarian challenge and potentially also explain a bit more how the approach has contributed to basically make interventions over most vulnerable populations more effective and targeted. Sure. Thanks so much for the question, Marco. Um, and also thank you for the opportunity to participate in this panel. Very happy to be here. Um, so again, Carolyn Flory, I'm the Senior Director for the Technology for Development Group at Mercy Corps, which is a humanitarian and development organization that operates in over 40 countries around the world um, and is headquartered in, in the United States. Mercy Corps has a focus on a few outcome areas. Um, just a, a quick, a brief introduction. Um, food security, water security, peace and good governance, and economic opportunity. Um, and these are found in our new 10-year strategy that was released last year, which we call Pathway to Possibility, which really centers the climate crisis as a core part of our programming. Um, and my team at Mercy Corps, the Technology for Development team, focuses on how to integrate digital and data services into the work that Mercy Corps does. We have a focus on digital peace building, climate and technology, digital cash and voucher assistance, digital information, and, and data science. So, so directly to, to your question, um, Mercy Corps has been able to really dive into this intersection of data and technology and the humanitarian and, and disaster response. And so we've done this in close collaboration with both our country and regional partners through our programmatic work, as well as in partnership with private sector partners like uh, private sector technology partners like Cisco and Amazon Web Services. Um, technology and data has truly allowed us to amplify and accelerate the provision of services and programmatic reach for our humanitarian and development response. And so I'll provide three very brief, I promise, examples that give a good sense of the diverse use of technology and data for our humanitarian response in our work. So the first example is from Latin America. So in Guatemala, cyclones are, are really prevalent and can result in pushing households further into, into poverty. And so Mercy Corps is working on an initiative that focuses on anticipatory action for the Americas in partnership with a financial service provider called Remitly and the Immigration Policy Lab um, at Stanford University that focuses on the early release of remittances for resilience and recovery. So we're piloting the use of automated alerts to send out early warnings to people in the United States who regularly send remittances to their friends and family in Central America. So when a tropical storm is on the way, these senders get a heads up on their phone applications. Um, and there's also an added financial incentive for sending remittances early. Uh, the pilot of this forecast-based remittance service was completed in Guatemala during the 2022 hurricane season last year, and we're hoping to scale this up across Central America for this hurricane season with automated forecast monitoring. Um, so that's one example. Um, next, and, and these are all a, a little bit different and why I wanted to highlight different ones. The next one is, is shifting to the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where Mercy Corps' crisis analytics team, or um, what we call the DRC hat, it's working to aggregate and analyze data to improve decision making in complex crises. So the team recognizes that in order to have a nuanced understanding of the evolving DRC conflict, we need a way to help predict potential crises and understand which communities to target in this emergency, in emergency response. So they've developed a 44 indicator index across seven domains. And before it was a manual process that was incredibly time intensive using Google Sheets, Excel, et cetera. Um, but in collaboration with our team, the technology for development data science team, we've been able to visualize this conflict data dynamically for the very first time. So we've developed a solution that can be easily visualized and shared in near real time with partners who rely on this data and analysis for operations and planning responses. Response. And no other organization in the region has achieved this level of data accuracy or completeness. So it's a it's a real game changer for, for our team in DRC. And the last example that I'll provide is from the Middle East, from Yemen, a country that's been facing an economic crisis for several years that has really affected and crippled its currency and, and economic prospects. Um, so as a result of the economic crisis, 24 million Yemenis or 80% of the population are now in need of humanitarian assistance. And we worked with the crisis analytics team in the country to develop um, what we call the Yemen Economic Tracking Initiative or YETI. Um, and YETI tracks economic trends in real time and gathers important 
important information that helps policymakers and aid workers make better decisions. Um, and these range from topics around currency stabilization, economic recovery, delivery of cash and markets programming in the country. Um, so, so a real range of information that's provided through this tracker. Um, and yet he began in 2020 as a means to address this scarcity of timely, accurate, targeted information on economic trends in Yemen. And since the launch of the current platform, Yeti has experienced real growth um, with more than 5,000 views between you know, the first three months of 2023, which nearly eclipsed the total um, for the entire year of 2022 in just three months. Um, so these are just a few examples of the innovative ways that Mercy Corps is using technology and data to tackle humanitarian and disaster response, really as a way to target, better target our interventions uh, for programming decisions, and also to make sure that we're reaching the most vulnerable communities um, and populations that we're working with. Thanks. Thank you, Caroline. This is really insightful to hear about like these concrete use cases of how technology is used to address humanitarian challenges. So thank you by Monique Tungia, who is the founder and executive director of Green Girls Organization. Can you tell us a bit more about how your organization leverages AI to address humanitarian challenges? Okay, thank you, Marco, for having me again on uh, you know, the, the, the program. Uh, Monique Tungia is the founder and executive director of the Green Girls Organization, and we are Africa's only Pan-African energy social enterprise that is actually using AI to identify the specific clean energy problems that women and girls face in African villages. That's simply put. So we've been the pace setter since 2015 that the organization was founded. And what we do and what we have been doing normally is we developed an innovative scoring model called the MNKB92 model that we patented because surprisingly my background is low, how I got into you know, renewable energy is a very, very long story. So the, the algorithm enables us to provide the specific clean energy um, solutions in regards to identifying what are the specific clean energy problems that these women and girls face. So we do not find ourselves in this vicious cycle and trap of dictating solutions. So for example, before we go into an African rural community, we already know what kind of clean energy solutions are we going to provide? Is it going to be solar installations that are going to provide these women and girls with electricity, lighting, or biogas installations that are going to get us to use the organic waste that we find in the villages to be able to you know, construct biodigesters and provide the women with clean cooking fuel? So that's the first part of what we are, we are doing. The second part of our work consists of equipping these women and girls with what we call eco-entrepreneurial skills. So for the solar trainings, we are training the women and the girls on how to assemble solar lamps. We create markets for them to sell these lamps, and then they keep 70% of the revenue, we keep 30% of the revenue. Because when the UN talks about sustainability, it's all about the fact that how do you keep impacting and changing lives? and achieving um, objectives 2030 of access to energy when the grant, when the aid stops coming in. At the same time, we also have to make uh, to know that nobody develops or grows based off of charity and aid. So that's how we came about our innovative sustainable business model. Now for the biogas trainings, we are training the women on how to collect organic fertilizer, what is normally called slurry, because this is an agricultural byproduct that you obtain when you construct biodigesters. We're teaching the women how to package this organic fertilizer. We create markets for them to sell. They keep 70% of the revenue and we keep 30% of the revenue. Now the revenue, we are always asked this question, the revenue, how do we distribute the revenue among the women? How do they make use of this revenue? Now, the third part is we are working with um, what they call credit unions, what they call in French, crédit coopératif and all. Credit unions are an amazing lever of, for development on the African continent because it's not complex like the banks where the women need collateral, you know, to save their money and all of that. We put the women in savings groups and the money is distributed among them. So look at us like the one-stop shop whereby before getting into a village, it's all dark. And then when we are leaving, there is light, 
there is um, clean cooking fuel. The women are financially empowered. The environment is clean. Education is on an all-time high. Health is improved. And our solution is replicable and, and scalable. We've worked across seven African countries, legally incorporated in 17 African countries. And I love what Caroline, the example she was, she was talking about, uh, it's good to see that, you know, organizations like Mercy Corps, uh, you know, leveraging the power of AI because the beauty of AI, I like to always say, is the fact that it, let me not say it's 100%, but it's 99.9% .9 precise. You know what you're doing. You know the, the problem you're solving at the roots. So you're solving the problem from the root cause because Green Girls came about the fact that working on the field and developing projects to, you know, promote education for the girl child, advocate against, you know, a lot of the societal issues that women go through in African villages. I realized that the real root cause problem was not solved because at the time, 2014, when I was a young programs director, I realized that I had received grants and I was building schools with partners and, you know, advocating for the girl child education across communities in other African countries. But I realized that without electricity, the girls would not be able to study at night. So then I realized the real root cause problem was not solved. And that's where organizations like ourselves, you know, whenever we have platforms like this, whenever we have opportunities to talk, we tell the donors and the funders that it's one thing to have the money, it's another thing to know what, what do the people actually need? Are we actually solving the real root cause problem? How are we leveraging technology? Because technology has been the future like for decades. We just keep innovating on what is working. Once upon a time, we're talking about, you know, um, industrialization or now it's all about AI, but AI is all, has always been there. There's just been an innovation and, you know, young entrepreneurs like ourselves on the African continent are, make, are making do with what we can do in regards to our context. So we are standing out and we are at the forefront of innovation and we've been um, at the forefront of innovation for eight years because you have to be foresighted irrespective of your context. I always like to talk from an African perspective saying that it's challenging working on the African continent, but there are systems in place. The systems are not as organized like the developed world, but it's not about borrowing from the West. It's not about imposing and dictating that because this is what is done in Silicon Valley, because this is what is done in this country, that is what it should be done on the African continent. No, we have our own systems that work for us in regards to our context because no two communities, no two countries are experiencing the same kind of problems and no two humanitarian crises are the same regardless of the, the context. Um, the humanitarian crisis that Cameroon is facing, for example, right now, be it um, in regards to the Anglophone crisis or the refugee crisis from the Eastern region, you know, uh, the people from Central African Republic, it's a different context to people who are facing that crisis in Congo. It's a totally different context. The beauty of our work is we can work in all these contexts. We can always customize our solutions because women will always need energy. Girls will always need energy. Um, irrespective of the crisis, they will always need energy for sustainability, for development, for education, for health purposes, you name it. So in a nutshell, that's what we have been doing. And the impact has been amazing. It has been uh, over, what, 78 uh, Communities impacted over 5,000 women, 8,000 girls. Trainings, we, we train, we have 25 different programs. I cannot get into the programs, but it's phenomenal. And uh, yeah, that's what we've been doing. Thanks, Monique. Um, and also, thanks for the reminder, obviously, of the importance of the specificity of the context. And it's great to see how, actually, in Africa, some technologies are leapfrogging and uh, you know, going faster than, uh, than in Western countries. Um, what a great panel. Thank you, everyone, for the first, uh, first uh, answer. And uh, Stefano, back to you. Actually, on the importance of context, you already told us how Mubadala Energy is pioneering an approach that brings together technology to address human needs. Can you tell us a bit more about how the advancements in technology can impact both your business and your ability to help communities? And also, potentially, some success stories about, for example, how Mubadala Energy is utilizing technology uh, for good, both locally and internationally. Sure, thank you, Marco. This could be a very long discussion, so I will try to focus on the, on the, on the key points. So first of all, 
uh, technology is uh, disrupting uh, almost uh, every industry on earth and uh, the energy our industry the energy uh, industry is uh, no exception um, maybe uh, and there are many many different technologies that are being uh, developed and, and deployed but maybe for the the discussion of today i would like to focus on uh, digitalization we heard from uh, Caroline, how this technology has been used in our organization. Maybe I can uh, also make a parallel on uh, what we are doing and how we see digitalization helping uh, the energy industry. For us, it's more, it's more than just an opportunity. Uh, we believe it is in, imperative to apply this uh, new digital technology. Um, first of all, the efficiencies that the uh, technology enables are part of our uh, sustainability story for our sector, for our industry. Uh, making our uh, assets, our investment operate uh, for longer uh, and requiring uh, fewer uh, resources over the lifespan of a project uh, implies sustainability of, 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 of the project, sustainability of the delivery of the energy. Second, this uh, technology uh, drive uh, uh, cost down and uh, make our business more sustainable while increasing uh, reliability and affordability, allowing us to focus on uh, ways to accelerate uh, decarbonization. So uh, on one side, the technology is allowing to improve the efficiency and uh, allowing us to put more attention, more resources on how we can uh, decarbonize our business which is uh, one uh, of our key drivers in the energy in the energy transition. To support these uh, uh, new initiatives uh, and our digital uh, uh, transformation, we have established an internal uh, uh, committee which oversees and uh, drives and steers all the efforts ac across the organization on what we want to achieve. We have uh, selected one of our key uh, um, uh, uh, producing assets, a gas field in Malaysia, uh, to create a, a digital twin, uh, which will uh, enable uh, state-of-the-art uh, practices, uh, such as uh, uh, integration of subsurface and uh, surface operations, uh, uh, predictive maintenance, and uh, a very important topic uh, to us, which is uh, intelligent HSS HSSC. Uh, through this uh, digital twin, uh, we can uh, remotely monitor and ana analyze operations. Since we, we talked about uh, humanizing uh, technology, I would like maybe spend another few minutes on the uh, HSC, uh, the, uh, uh, intelligent HSC. Uh, as you all know, our industry, it's a high risk, uh, it's a high risk uh, uh, industry, um, uh, safety, environmental, is uh, 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 one of our key, if not the key uh, uh, priority in what we, what we do in uh, every day, uh, in our business every day, we focus on the HSC and we make sure uh, we take care uh, of our people and make sure they uh, go back home safely uh, every day. So we believe that uh, uh, digital technology has a strong potential to improve the safety performance. Uh, we can use uh, technology such as uh, geofencing to map and track where every one of our uh, people offshore or onshore are located, making sure that they don't uh, access uh, uh, areas which are uh, uh, risky or uh, uh, with limited uh, access and allow us to intervene immediately be before it becomes a uh, uh, high, high exposure. We can use uh, sensors on the on the uh, protective uh, uh, equipment the on the what they wear to ensure that they are not exposing themselves uh, to conditions that are uh, can create uh, health conditions whether it's a uh, temperature or uh, certain emissions uh, and uh, and uh, uh, fire zones and so on and similarly we can use uh, cameras to monitor and ensure that uh, we, uh, the people offshore are respecting uh, uh, the, 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 the um, safe conditions and the safe acts before uh, it triggers a uh, uh, risky, risky situation. So this is uh, an area where uh, uh, we are uh, uh, 
in studying and in investing and uh, uh, delivering uh, real value to, to our people. Um, similarly, we see that uh, this technology can also support uh, uh, um, the work and the initiatives we have uh, for our uh, community and uh, CSR uh, uh, projects. And just to mention uh, 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 a key one we are working on, we, we have engaged in, our, uh, in, the, in a major uh, uh, mangroves uh, planting effort in the UAE. Uh, committing uh, to planting uh, uh, over 100 million uh, mangroves by 2030. And we have partnered with a company that is providing uh, drone technology for various applications. And we are combining the use of this uh, drone technology with uh, data analytics uh, to target the best locations for, uh, planting, uh, for planting and for the drones to drop the seeds in a randomized ways that basically reflects how nature uh, would do it. We see uh, this technology, um, a breakthrough uh, in, uh, in, in this project. And uh, we are very keen to look also how this technology can be used in uh, other areas. At the same time, we also uh, very much um, working on the development of the people in our uh, local force, uh, investing in their uh, training and uh, develop, uh, development and ensuring we maximize the local uh, resources and we bring them up to the level uh, uh, where they are able to uh, uh, utilize and implement uh, this uh, these, uh, new technology. Um, these are just a few examples, but we strongly believe that uh, technology is uh, key in, uh, in delivering our uh, uh, ambitions and our uh, 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 objectives in uh, delivering back to the communities there where we were, where we are present. Thank you. Many thanks, Stefano. Uh, really, really insightful use cases at the cutting edge of, uh, uh, of technology. And also for people listening, uh, you mentioned mangroves. Obviously, mangroves have the highest carbon removal potential per hectare and all sorts of other benefits. So it's really great to hear about this type of project. Um, Alexander, back to you. And uh, Stefan mentioned before the importance of partnerships and how it's in, in their DNA. Can you tell us about how partnerships have enabled you to improve the efficiency and the effectiveness of your, your humanitarian work? And obviously, feel free to tell us about any success story or any specific use of technology. OK, thank you. First, first of all, I will begin to, to, to say that NGO are not here to solve all the problem. We know we, we don't have all the skill to, to solve all the problem. We know that uh, companies and mainly states are the most important uh, elements in, in one country. And if you want to solve poverty issue, you need to have normal business, you need to have inclusive business, you need to have social business, and you need to have a strong power of a state and a strong regulation and a, a real will of uh, politicians. Uh, so we are only solving a small issues, but we know uh, that even in 10 years, in 20 years, uh, some people won't be reachable by the market. Uh, some people will be able to pay. Will, it will be affordable to them to pay for electricity, but some of them in Africa, in Asia, in small part of South America won't be able to pay for it. So it's our job and it's, it's where we are. Our goal is not to replace other actors. And, and that's, that's the, the root uh, element we need to focus on when we are speaking about partnership. We need to be at the right place at the right moment. And partnership, it's, uh, it's all about this point. Uh, so when, when I think about partnership, I begin to think what are my main skills? What are the main skills of my organization? For, for mine, for electrician of the border, I would say we are good in building an uh, inclusive, socially inclusive uh, model to make our project, uh, let's say, sustainable in a, from an economic point of view in very, very poor area, which can be, uh, which can be solved by uh, normal companies. It's one of our big skills. The other one is our technical capabilities to build a solar installation 
even in a very complex area, uh, even when you don't have the best uh, material, uh, the best components, uh, with uh, some uh, low-tech uh, added uh, value inside, uh, we are able to do so. But there are some parts of our project. We need other people and we need partners. First of all, we need donors. Without donors, without big funders, we are unable to, to do our work. Let, let's be honest, let's say the truth. We, we, we have to find money to, to put in place our project. And for example, the, the French Development Agency is one of our biggest partners. And in a way, we are dependent to, to this donor. Um, but, but it's great to say it's a partner. Uh, and for example, they, they have been really delighted by the fact we won the prize in 2020. The, the international recognition it gave to our work is uh, very important for them. The second point I want to focus on is the importance of technology and of technology pro provider. Uh, we are not building electrical components. We are not building uh, solar panels or solar lamps. We know how to install them, but we need to have good product, robust, robust and very good uh, produced. Uh, and they need to be good uh, when you look at the life cycle of the product. If you just look at uh, the building of the product, maybe it has been built with a solar panel on the roof of the factory and with good plastic, but it's not repairable. You cannot manage uh, an issue with a battery inside the solar lamp. You can be sure in three years, it will be uh, maybe in the river next to the village uh, you put your operation. Uh, maybe uh, in the middle of the village uh, without any use for people. So it's it's a major point, and we need to be sure the people we are working with are really focusing on this point. It is to say, uh, assessing the last life cycle uh, value of their products. And for example, in Africa, we are working with a company which is named La Gazelle. They have different factory in Burkina Faso, in Benin, in Senegal for the moment. There are also a small one in the middle of France, only for the European market. And we are working currently with them because they are building very robust solar lamp, which are really adapted to the local context we are working uh, on. Uh, it's, it's made of steel. You can throw it away. It won't break. When the battery is over, you can replace it easily. When the, the lamp inside is broken, you can order a new one and you can replace it. And we are creating a new um, a new new way to repair it because they are, they, they are currently creating a lot of uh, reparator uh, through the different country they are operating to make it profitable for people to repair their lamps. And um, yeah, that, that, that's... But for example, a partner we are we are very proud of because without them, we won't be able to to to, to give good good lamps to the people who are working for. Um, other other uh, partner are more classical, but it's uh, obvious uh, that we need to work with uh, local communities, with local NGO, with local association. If we want to understand the local context, if we want to understand the, logo, the local culture, if we want to speak in the local language too, uh, we are all speaking in English uh, currently. For some of us, it's natural. For other, it's a little effort. But when you are working somewhere in Africa, in Asia, in South America, it's always better to speak in the language of the community. And if you if you are not partnering with good people, with good associations which are recognized uh, locally, you can be sure your language, English, French, doesn't matter, won't be the good language to speak to people. Uh, and the last one, and maybe that's the most uh, important to be to be efficient, that's essential, you need to respect the law. You need to respect the regulation where you are working. and. Mm, it it can it can be seldom to to respect it perfectly where wherever you are because it's, sometimes it's very complex. But if you don't study it very well before putting in place your project, you can be sure the local authority won't be a partner for you, and you better you better be uh, a partner with local authority uh, if you want to deploy a, a sustainable project over the long run. Thanks, Alexandre and and Caroline. Can you tell us a bit more about uh, Percy Corps and you, how advancements in technology and 
data accessibility have transformed the landscape of humanitarian assistance. And maybe also a bit more about uh, you know, the collaborations and initiatives that you believe are most crucial to bring technology um, you know, to fight poverty. Well, thanks so much uh, for the question, Marco. So over the past few years, um, there you know, have been a number of advancements um, in the use of data and data science in humanitarian and disaster response and international development. And so we've seen you know, this, this path, this continuum around the use of big and open data and artificial intelligence and machine learning that have already transformed the private sector um, and, and are now being employed more widely in the work that, that all of us are doing um, on, this, on this panel. And so these tools have been, are, are being used, or at least have the potential to be used for transforming how humanitarian assistance is delivered to communities. And so just a few of these, and, and um, some of the other panelists have touched on these as well. So just, it's a bit of a summary. Um, some of the use cases that we've seen and that we want to advance in our work at Mercy Corps, one is around targeting. So the use of data science using both publicly available information and also more private um, program data will allow us to better target the most vulnerable and marginalized communities, populations that organizations like ours works with. Um, and so it will really allow us to get to the subnational hyper local, as Alexander was saying, um, really being focused in on those that are the most affected um, to ensure that the interventions that we're implementing in collaboration with the communities are the right ones at the right place at the right time. So that's the first. Um, the second is around prescriptive and um, predictive analytics. So as mentioned before, using more sophisticated data analysis and data science will allow our sector to shift more from descriptive and diagnostic questions to predictive and prescriptive analysis. Um, and the nature of our work has just become so much more increasingly complex and interdependent um, with this overflow of data and information sources. And so being able to really harness uh, data insights for predictive and prescriptive analytics is another tool um, to guide our planning and programs. And the last one um, I'd like to mention is, is an integration with digital services. Um, so at Mercy Corps, we're trying to work to integrate data science with the service provision or program. So similar to the program that I mentioned in Guatemala, for example, linking data that triggers early warning systems to financial inclusion, digital financial inclusion, et cetera. Um, and so this extends from digital peace building targeting to this digital cash um, to climate data and analysis. And by utilizing this array of data, different types and sources, geospatial data, sentiment analysis, socioeconomic and economic data, and so on and so on, we're really able to better target our interventions and maximize the impact um, that we can have. And so for the second part of your question on, on key collaborations, I think that we've already heard some great examples from, uh, from my fellow panelists, but I would first want to highlight, um, going back to some of the comments that have been made, really thinking about that public and private sector partnership and how nonprofit organizations or NGOs can really be a bridge between these two sectors as hopefully a, a neutral and partial stakeholder. Um, and we've seen these advancements in the technology sector. I mean, everything from cloud computing, 5G connectivity to cryptocurrency, blockchain, generative AI. Um, and I think that partnering with the private sector will really allow us to test these potential use cases for the application of these innovative, frontier technologies for humanitarian and disaster response, but with this, this goal of also making them more accurate, making them more inclusive and comprehensive and applicable for the, for the use cases that we're working, uh, that we're working in. So I really think there is a, an aspect of mutual um, benefit that, that happens from those kind of partnerships and should. Um, I also think that we need more partnership on some of the behind the scenes work, the stuff that's not as potentially exciting, but really, really crucial um, in terms of technology and data accessibility. 
So for example, on data privacy and security, as well as data ethics and compliance, this is an area that I think a lot of organizations are struggling with, especially in the context that we're working in, where the regulatory environments may not be um, you know, caught up to at the advancements that are happening in technology. And so I think that we can take lessons, again, to, I think, to Monique's point, and, and Alexander brought this up too, take lessons, but adapt those for the context that we're working about how we're using this private um, information and data, um, and ensure that we have adequate systems in place to protect it from, from anyone that may use, um, may wish to misuse or, or abuse it. Um, and so similarly, better partnering with um, other organizations, the public sector, to better understand a value evaluate and advocate for regulatory environments that can maintain this pace and, and keep up with and make sure that we are protecting the, the, uh, the amount of data, the types of data that we're collecting, which is a lot, and make sure that we're being responsible as um, organizations um, as well. And to make sure, and that's a critical component of this too. Again, um, with that contextualized vision, not coming in, helicoptering in, and thinking that we have the answer based on what's been developed, um, but doing that in partnership um, in a contextualized way. Thanks. Thank you, Caroline. Really, really interesting. And uh, Monique, <clears throat> your uh, work really exemplifies the integration of technology and humanitarianism. Can you share with us a specific success story uh, where? For example, the application of AI by Green Girls organization has resulted in, in, in positive change uh, for, for individuals and communities. Yeah, thank you very much for that question, Marco. You know, at the core of what we do, there are three key words that govern our work, innovation, impact, and, and sustainability. So we say wherever we find ourselves on the African continent, whichever African rock community we find ourselves, we must innovate because no two African communities are the same. That in um, a community, for example, in Cameroon, we carried out solar and biogas installations. It doesn't mean that in another community, maybe in, in another region in Cameroon, we're going to do solar and biogas. It all depends. We are going to provide our solutions in regards to the specific clean energy problems that the algorithm identifies. Impact, we have to impact. And when we talk about impact, it's not all about, you know, like the the evident impact that you're going to see, you know, lights, lights in electricity, um, clean cooking for, it's the fact that we have to cut down bronchial issues when it comes to health health, um, health problems, because a lot of the, the women or the girls, they suffer serious bronchial, they're going to be looking at indicators like, have we been able to eradicate sexual exploitation, sexual harassment, because what you see is the fact that they don't have access to lights, but you'll be surprised that when you get into a lot of these villages, you have 11 year old girls, they are young mothers, they're suffering from fistula simply because she had to go into the forest to look for firewood for cooking. And in the course of that, she got raped and all. So you don't, it's not evident that we are also, you know, helping eradicate sexual exploitation or harassment and all, but that, whatever they are facing, suffering from fistula, being a teenage mom, is simply because they did not have access to, to light. So when we talk about an impact um, indicator, these are some of the things we're looking at. We also look to the fact that education should be on an all-time high because now the girls can study at night because the reality is in a typical African village, the girl child does everything, all the household chores. But now when we they have electricity, their health is improved, they can study at night, she no longer has to go and look for firewood for cooking, and all of that. So these are all the impact indicators that we have to look into and we have to achieve. Like it's a must, it's a non-negotiable. And when we and then the next thing is sustainability. It's great. You can develop the algorithm, you can adapt it to the context of the you know a problem you want to solve. But if you are not sustainable, if you're not able to work, even when the grant, the aid, whichever word you want to call it, doesn't come in, then you go back to square one. And you know, that's why we are able to work in whatever context against all odds, because you see, you know, the evidence. We are using AI, we are facetas and all of that, that innovation, solar installations, biogas installations, and all of that. But what you don't see is the fact that it's a whole chain. You have green girls, you have uh, um, local interpreters we work with, we have the uh, corporates, the credit unions that we are working with, we have focal points we are working with, we have 
um, the ministries that we also have to engage them because in as much as we are a political and all of that, we draft resolutions and policies for our governments to be able to implement so that we also serve as regulatory bodies and to serve as a regulatory body, you have to make sure that don't think a table is going to be created for you and then you're able to you know, do whatever you have to do, especially in a context like the African continent. What you have to know is understand your context and see how you can fit in. Because I always like to say, activism is not all about um, holding placards and going on the road. Activism could be the fact that you know your tattoo, your manner of dressing, your manner of approach. So we are at the forefront of serious activism when it comes to, hey, there's a climate crisis and the climate crisis is linked to a humanitarian crisis. You have to make sure that if you want to solve the problem from a real root cause, you have to um, make use of modern technologies and all of that. Am I holding a placard on the road screaming, um, um, refusing to eat and or no? My work is happening in an African rural community. I know how I'm getting African governments to be able to sit down and work with us, even if they don't want to work with us. So um, at the core, like we always say, impact, innovation, and sustainability. You might not see it, but when I get into the real context of it, and when I dig deep, then you understand, oh, okay, we now see why they are the, the, they are the only Pan-African energy social enterprise doing what they are doing. Because we touch other organizations, the work they do. We can work in whatever context. You bring us to World Health Organization, we can work with them. You bring us even people with like Mercy Corps, we can work with you guys, you understand? Because, um, in a refugee camp, we work with, with IDPs here, internally displaced here in Cameroon. Guess what we are doing? We are able to build community about that just as portable ones, not the, 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 not the um, fixed communal ones in the villages. But that's because we are harnessing the, the power of technology. Yes, we have a data problem in Africa, which we have identified. And that's why a lot of the times we are not writing grants, but we are selling this data because if you don't have the accurate data, how do you know you're solving a problem at the root cause? How do you know that, th that this money you're, 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 you're putting into the organization is actually serving its purpose? Do you understand? So impact, innovation, and sustainability, three key words that govern and structure even this algorithm that we developed. Thank you so much, Monique. Before we wrap up the session, I have uh, one final question for, for all of you. Will 2023 be named the year of sustainability? I would like to ask each of you to please share in one word, how would you describe the future of sustainability? And uh, Stefano, let's go with you first. Uh, thank you, Marco. Um, if you allow me, I will uh, use two words uh, put together. Um, first of all, uh, agility. Uh, the world is changing uh, fast and uh, Communities are uh, uh, facing uh, uh, existential challenges, but if we can move uh, quickly and apply uh, innovative solution and technology at the pace and the scale, uh, there are significant opportunities ahead. The second is commitment. Without a firm commitment, we will not be able uh, to drive our objectives of sustainability and uh, energy uh, transition. Thank you. Thank you, Stefano. Alexander, you're next. Yeah, thank you, Marco. Uh, it's clearly the question I, I thought the most about. It's so complex to, to sum up a very complex subject in one word. So I, I'm very sorry for that, but I will, I will use two words too. I will say socially inclusive because we are speaking about sustainability, but thinking about sustainability without thinking about fighting against poverty uh, is it, useless. It's a nonsense at the end because you, you have 700 million people who don't have electricity today. More, most of them are located in, in sub-Saharan Africa and they have the right to reach the same level, uh, the same living condition we, we have in Western uh, Europe, for example. So if you want to be efficient, uh, when you speak about sustainability, you need to think about poverty, how to fight against inequalities. And it's also right, it's also the same case in a rich country, in the United States, in France, uh, or maybe in China too, because there are less poor people, but the inequalities are booming. So it's also a matter 
in Europe and in the United States. So when you think about climate change, you think about fighting against poverty. Thanks, Alexandra. And what about your word, Caroline? Okay, I will. I'll I'll stick to one word. I I'll try. So my mine is um interdependent, uh, and I think that we're I use that word because I think that we're likely to see or, or hopefully um we'll see and definitely need more investment in sustainability across a range of sectors um that have been impacted by climate change both directly and indirectly. So we're already seeing these impacts. You know, obviously of climate change, everyone knows that the unprecedented floods that we're seeing in South Asia to the multi-year drought in in the Horn of Africa. These are affecting these communities across across various sectors. So and across various aspects of their lives. So affecting their livelihoods, regional and local economies, food security, nutrition, educational attainment, um, and leading to 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 things like conflict and insecurity crises. So so as we're we're seeing the impacts of climate change and as we think about the future of sustainability, um, we really need to uh, you know think about big bold solutions, interdependent, contextualized um and solutions to to these complex challenges thank you caroline and monique what about your word the word is going to be hope it's going to be hope i am an eternal optimist and if we are able to do all that we do especially for someone like myself and my team working in a very challenging uh context like on the african continent we are hopeful and we always have to be solutions oriented because there's no return on investment when it comes to complaining. The problems face you head on, like you're solving one problem in another problem and all of that. So it's just hope. Oh, we have to hope that governments, institutions, donors will get to understand us, will get to work with us, understand where those of us who are at the forefront why we tell them sometimes what we tell them if at all what i'm saying makes sense but we have to be hopeful that one day all of this this too shall pass there's going to be hope thank you monique and uh, it's a great conclusion of a panel so with that uh, i want to thank uh, all the guests for the valuable insights i also want to thank the audience for tuning in and if you want to watch the entire session this will be posted also on the zayed sustainability prize youtube channel so thank you again and have a great day.